we've been finding for the PE teachers, it's just been incredible. We had one PE teacher say that they've been teaching PE for 24 years and this program has been the most rewarding and impactful program they've ever taught. We are always advocating for protected uh, bike infrastructure, um, you know, separated by concrete barriers, for instance, so that um, the old paradigm of bike lanes was just a, a line of paint on the road. Um, and that is not confidence inspiring or, or necessarily safe. So, so now we're always advocating for separated, protected bike infrastructure. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Tina Castile and Paul Tolome from Cascade Bicycle Club up in the state of Washington. We're gonna be talking about some of the great initiatives that they have underway. So let's get right to it with Paul and Tina. Paul and Tina, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Great to be here, John. Hey, guys, I love giving my guests an opportunity just to introduce themselves. So, Tina, let's start off with you. Uh, who the heck is Tina? <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, so I, I'm Tina. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I work at a wonderful organization called the Cascade Bicycle Club. I'm one of the program officers with this new statewide bicycle education grant program that we are uh, creating and administering uh, on behalf of the Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, what else about me? Uh, I grew up uh, in the Skagit Valley uh, in Washington State. I'm, I'm currently in Seattle right now, so very much feel like home here. And like a lot of people, learning to ride a bike was you know, key part of my childhood. I had a cheap silver and blue BMX style bike that I just love to ride. Um, and I really fell in love with, you know, doing bike education for young people while I was working in higher education, doing college access and supporting students with, you know, their future goals to uh, go to college um, and become whatever it is they, they want to become and, and help change the world. And I did some volunteering with a really wonderful, small but mighty nonprofit called the Vamos Outdoors Project, which is located in Bellingham, Washington. Vamos uh, works with uh, migrant, um, Latine, multilingual youth in uh, removing barriers to um, outdoor recreation. And I was one of their ride leaders uh, for their uh, youth cycling program and really fell in love with that work. It was really exciting. and. I've always been passionate about, you know, helping connect people to the outdoors. Um, and that's because I, during college, worked for two summers for the North Cascades National Park Service. Um, and so I love spending time outside and I love it even more when I'm with other people. I enjoy biking, camping, hiking, and eating really good food. So yeah, it's a little bit about me. I love it. I love it. Paul, you're up. Yeah, I'm Paul Tolme. I'm the media relations manager and uh, for Cascade Bicycle Club. I, I have the great pleasure of being able to tell and share the stories of all the great works that um, my colleagues like Tina are doing. Uh, and Cascade is, uh, was formed in uh, 1970, so we're a 54-year-old organization. And Cascade Bicycle Club and its long, uh, many decades of existence really is why Washington State is perennially named one of the most bike friendly states in the country. We've been, we've been working to promote the joy of bicycling here for decades. And we have uh, close to 10,000 members. And we're, we're, we have our three pillars, as we call them, education, which Tina is part of the education team. In, addi in addition to the in-school programs, we have all the learn to ride programs for people of any age adults uh and uh and that's those are given on a sliding scale basis so that people who are wealthier can can pay more for those lessons and and people who are less affluent can pay less or nothing at all because we don't want to be anybody to be denied um access to bicycles and then we also have a huge policy and advocacy program right now in seattle our policy team is working with the city council to try to get more funding for bike infrastructure and that's an ongoing initiative and we also do the same thing statewide in olympia 
And then we have our community events program as well, our other pillar, which is the big rides we do, uh, such as Seattle to Portland um, has been going on for decades. And that maybe is one of the best known kind of longest continuous bike rides in the country. Big group ride. We don't put on races. We put on rides because everybody who joins our events is a winner and everybody who pays to enter one of our rides is supporting our education and our uh, advocacy work. So that's Cascade Bicycle Club in a nutshell. I came to this group as a former journalist uh, because I really wanted to use my skills to help this great organization and make Seattle and Washington even more bike friendly and accessible to all. Fantastic. Uh, so it sounds like the the Cascade Bicycle organization and the formal name is, is the Bicycle Club. Is it a 501c3 or is it a 501c3 c4? Two answers there. Yes, we Cascade Bicycle Club is a 501c3. And then we have our partner organization called Washington Bikes, which is a 501c4. And they work in Olympia or we work in Olympia because many of us wear two hats. Um, and so, yes, our Washington Bikes is... is uh, the history is there were two organizations in the past and in the early 2000 teens, they merged. And now we have these two organizations, but really working in concert, 501c3, 501c4, which does uh, political endorsements. So uh, Washington Bikes um, endorses uh, bike friendly candidates in the fall. Yeah, I wanted to, to uh, belabor that just a moment because it's a it's a good point to uh, when you look at uh, membership organizations as well as nonprofit organizations. Um, you, you as a C three, you're sort of limited on the amount of true engagement you can have from a political perspective. But as a C four, yes, you you can endorse candidates, you can do political forums, you can lobby, you can do work at the state level as well as the local level in that sense. sense. So that's fantastic. Well, this is great. I mean, I, I I have my roots, you know, in also bike advocacy, nonprofits and organizations, and doing bike ed uh, programs. So I know that we're going to have a lot of fun uh, talking about all these great initiatives that you all are doing. And Tina, you had mentioned a little bit about your passion for, for education. Uh, let's, let's start with you. Why don't you dive in and talk a little bit about uh, some of the programs that you all are doing at the, at the school and sort of as that basis, let's pull up the webpage here for the statewide school-based bicycle education program. Yeah, thanks. So as Paul shared a little bit of information about um, Cascade as the 501c3, uh, one of our pillars of work is education. We teach the joys of cycling and we teach both young people and adults. I always love to give a shout out to our adult education classes because, you know, it, it's pretty brave as an adult to learn how to ride a bike. Um, and so it's wonderful that we offer that resource to uh, our community members. But uh, we're also a leader in providing really high quality school-based bicycle education programs. Uh, we do that through two of our flagship programs that we've been operating um, for over a decade. And uh, one of those programs, it's called Let's Go, that targets elementary and middle school students in grades three through eight. And that has been the Let's Go program. It's a uh, PE bike education curriculum unit. Uh, so it takes place in PE classes and it covers basic bicycle education and pedestrian safety skills. Um, and so PE teachers are running it. We do all the professional development training to the PE teachers, you know, as bike education experts. So Let's Go is currently running in all Seattle public uh, elementary schools, and it's been doing so since 2016. And it's been having a really great impact on those students, and it's been really successful. And the other program, our other flagship program is called the Major Taylor Project, um, which is running in different middle schools and high schools um, in King County in Seattle and um, in Pierce County in Tacoma. And that program breaks down barriers to cycling for youth of color um, by offering bike programs in after school settings. And their namesake actually comes from Marshall Taylor, who was a Black American cycling champion who broke down uh, racial barriers during the Jim Crow era 
era in America. So we have these two incredible flagship programs that have been successful. Um, and I share that story because those programs are really serving as our model, as our inspiration for this new statewide uh, school-based uh, bicycle education program that we are designing as well as administering um, thanks to some uh, really great funding that was passed through the Move Ahead Washington uh, legislation. I love it. This is great. Yeah. And, and the Major Taylor uh, Project, uh, many cities uh, and states have Major Taylor projects and Major Taylor uh, events. Um, again, he was a, a black uh, racer, bike racer back in the day when uh, we had the velodromes. And, and so one of, one of uh, arguably one of the most talented uh, bike racers ever to exist. This, this is fantastic. Uh, Paul, before we hit the, the record button, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the, the statewide initiatives and things that were going on. And specifically, we talked a little bit about how um, the state's uh, Climate Commitment Act is related to a lot of these initiatives that you all are doing. Can you explain that sort of relationship? Absolutely. So our state legislature passed the Climate Commitment Act which is a polluter pays initiative to bring down carbon emissions in the state of Washington. And then those revenues generated through the Climate Commitment Act are dispersed uh, to programs such as the school-based uh, bicycle safety education program, which is just one of the many uh, initiatives, which include everything from uh, pr promoting more renewable energy and all of the normal things you would consider as part of a carbon emissions or, or climate law. But the bicycle education portion of that uh, funding is the thinking there is we, the state, the state legislature really wants to encourage our youth to become lifelong bicyclists for transportation. As we know, and as your listeners and watchers know, Bicycling is not just a recreational activity. It's not a sport. It's not just uh, racing. Bikes are an incredibly affordable, equitable, green source of transportation. And that really is part of the heart of Cascade Bicycle Club's mission. And so the Climate Commitment Act is funding this statewide expansion, which is allowing our youth across Washington to learn this lifelong, life essential skill of bicycling for transportation health as well. And so, yeah, the Climate Commitment Act is shows Washington state's leadership on climate activism. And um, we are grateful to our state legislature, state legislators for uh, including this program within uh, the funding uh, that comes from that act. Yeah. And I can imagine if the, the state of Washington is like any other state here in the United States, uh, there are detractors and people who are, are trying to reverse that that progress that you all are making. Uh, what, what's sort of the zeitgeist there in the state of Washington, you know, in regards to this particular act as as well as, you know, just trying to change the status quo of drive everywhere for everything? Well, I'll take this, Tina, again. Well, yes, there is an initiative on the ballot in November to repeal the Climate Commitment Act. So we obviously have our position on that. And one of the reasons we want to talk with you and why we are talking to so many uh, journalists across Washington is we want parents out there in the community to know that bicycle education is one of the incredible benefits that uh, their youth and their families are, are getting uh, from this act. And so we'll see what happens in November. And the Climate Commitment Act is very new. And so the state, as well as all of the partner organizations who are doing, you know, home weatherizations and, and work on, uh, on many of the tribal lands in the state of Washington, we're trying to really inform folks across Washington that um, this, this act delivers a lot of incredible programming that benefits Washingtonians. Yeah. So Tina, when, when I think of, you know, and I remember back to my days of teaching bike ed, uh, you know, to the fourth graders uh, there uh, in Hawaii on, on Hawaii Island, uh, we tried to get out to each of the elementary schools there on the island and, and uh, you know, teach some of the, the typical 
safety skills and how to how to break, how to start. Uh, sometimes we're even teaching the kids how to ride because uh, ultimately in any given fourth uh, fourth grade class, we realized there were some kids that didn't know how to ride. So I would have instructors help them out. I get the sense that uh, some of the activities that you are involved with are, are very similar. So some of these images that you all have sent my way uh, bring back memories, good memories. Talk a little bit about the sort of the structure of the program. I saw that it was from grade three through eight. Um, walk us through how you all are working with, uh, you know, the various schools, how many schools are, are currently being served uh, under the statewide program thus far. Sure. Yeah, I, I have. I just love my job because I get to not only help co-design, um, you know, a youth uh, cycling program for elementary and middle school students, um, but I also really get to manage those partnerships where we cascade as a pass through funder. You know, we're getting this funding from um, the Washington State Department of Transportation and we're uh, managing this grant process to then award grant funding to school districts across the state to administer this bike education program that we're designing and then get to, you know, report on all the wonderful impacts that this program has been having. And boy, uh, it has been exciting and it's been overwhelmingly positive. And so to back up a bit further, uh, we're only in our very first year of administering this new statewide program. You know, I was sharing earlier, uh, we kind of got a little bit of a head start because we have these two amazing cascade, you know, flagship programs that are inspiring our program model. But uh, we have a, a, you know, a few more years to go. Our goal by 2039 is that we're serving 90% of eligible students in the elementary and middle school age. And for the middle school and high school program, the youth development program, their goal is to serve at least 10,000 youth. Um, So in our first year, uh, we have eight partnerships across uh, six school districts. And then we are serving those small rural districts because we can't forget about those. They're, they're very important to us. This is a statewide program. We want to be a true statewide program where we have a geographic reach and a great um, geographic dispersion and we're in all corners of the state. And so we're working with ESD 171, which covers like the Wenatchee central part of the state. And we're also with ESD 189, uh, which is like the northwest corner, you know, Island, Whatcom, Skagit, and Snohomish counties. Um, And so those eight partners are currently running the statewide elementary uh, program in over 20 school districts, which covers about 52 elementary schools, 52 elementary schools. Um, And together, those are projected to serve in our first year alone about 8,400 students. Fantastic. Fantastic. And we've been uh, scrolling through some images here and taking a look at a little vi- uh, uh, video here of how to navigate the stop and, and be able to turn. One of the biggest challenges from a, a, an advocacy perspective is, is obviously it's one thing to teach the skills to be able to safely ride a bike. And, and, and for that matter, we even had a, a pedestrian education program, too, that we would teach to first graders of, you know, how to cross the street safely and, and things of that nature. So that's skills building. The other side of it, and Paul, this is going to be for you, is from the advocacy side of trying to build safer networks within our communities. So that it's actually safe for kids to be able to walk and bike to school. So it's safe for everyone to be able to get to their meaningful destinations, all ages and abilities. Can you talk a little bit to what you all are doing as the as the Cascade Club to be able to encourage and and help facilitate, you know, that because you can't build it. That's that's up to the government to build it. But you all can can help rally the forces. Uh, Talk a little bit about that commitment and what you all are doing to help improve the, uh, the environment that's out there. Yeah. uh, Cascade Bicycle Club, because of our, our huge reach, I I mentioned 10,000 members, as well as all of the folks who participate in our rides, we have a big community of, of folks who support us. And so right now, if we were to look at Seattle, our a policy team is working with the mayor and the Seattle City Council 
to uh, pass what's going to be called the, the next big Seattle transportation levy. And this uh, essentially will be on the ballot as well in November. This is the every decade uh, ask where we uh, the city asks uh, taxpayers, do you want to increase your property taxes a little bit to fund many things transportation related, including bike infrastructure? So our policy and advocacy team was very effective in, in bringing community groups from across the city to City Hall, letting the city council know that there is great support for more big bike infrastructure. And so fingers crossed that the appropriation that the mayor uh, and the city council are now deliberating $114 million plus uh, for bike infrastructure in Seattle will be approved by voters in uh, November. At the state level, we have our uh, uh, Washington Bikes, our 501c4, which works in the legislature, which really was instrumental in getting this big state appropriation through Move Ahead Washington. That was a, trans, a statewide transportation law passed a few years back, which was the real genesis of this statewide uh, bike education effort. And so we work closely with legislators. We try to train individuals across Washington to be advocates in their own communities for to be able to speak to their elected officials that the public wants more safe bike infrastructure. Yes, for sure, you, you really hit it on the head. A lot of people want to ride bikes, including kids, but a lot of people are scared to ride bikes uh, on the street, unfortunately, and that's due to a lack of uh, not enough safe bike infrastructure. We've made great strides, strides here in Seattle in terms of the ever-growing bike network, but there's still always gaps and we need more. And there are parts of Seattle, especially South Seattle, historically black parts of Seattle, unfortunately, due to redlining and other historic practices, the infrastructure there is lacking and we are really trying to improve it there. And so, yes, we encourage everybody to get out on a bike because every person who rides a bike becomes another advocate for safer bike infrastructure. Yeah. And one of the interesting things, too, and uh, actually I'm going to pull up a, a cool video here. This is actually um, in Seattle. This is a protected intersection that just recently went in, was, is making the news all over the place. I mean, this is, this is some encouraging stuff when we start to see, you know, sort of Dutch level and Danish level infrastructure going in, in North America. Here's the protected intersection. And this is what we're kind of talking about. And obviously this is sort of, a, you know, oriented more towards big city types of things. When we talk about, you know, the smaller rural environments, um, then we're talking about some destinations, some distances that maybe aren't as great. Um, but then it's a matter of having, you know, some traffic calm streets and some quieter streets and low volume streets so that kids can walk and bike to school and, and all that. Tina, when with your programs and your initiatives, are there any um, like sort of outreach programs to like encourage communities, especially maybe some of those rural communities or some of those neighborhoods uh, to do like walking school buses or bike buses to be able to encourage, uh, you know, them to, to be able to get to school as a group and practice some of those skills you guys have done? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. As I shared earlier, we're in our first year of program implementation. So there has just been an ongoing feedback loop, right? Uh, uh, ongoing data that's coming in from our partners. Um, and that's because a big part of our sustainability model is providing our partners with a partnership manager. Um, and that's my colleague, Dylan, who um, it, it provides like excellent technical uh, support and expertise to our partners to really um, meet with them um, and provide updates, track progress, uh, and provide any support they our partners may may need in terms of any challenges to implementing the program, but also to help kind of troubleshoot what they're hearing from the students um, and their families that they're serving. And interesting enough, when we were out in the central part of the state, you know, when I was recruiting partners, really trying to get them interested in partnering with us uh, for this grant program, 
uh, the feedback we heard was this message or image of, of cycling of a bike as a transportation tool wasn't really relevant to some of these communities because of uh, one of the reasons is because of this lack of cycling infrastructure. However, they did know that um, cycling has a lot of health benefits. And uh, that was really interesting for us to learn. And it really helped us shift how we engage with communities that have different uh, transportation uh, resources. And so that's one thing. The other thing that I um, that comes to mind uh, for us, because, you know, we are doing bicycle education and pedestrian safety, there are some parts of, you know, cycling, ability to access safe cycling that fall out of our scope. And so in this pilot year, one of the things I'm really trying to focus on is how to navigate this ecosystem of different stakeholders and beneficiaries that are part of the cycling community. Uh, And one of those is um, the Safe Routes to School Network, which Safe Routes to School, it's a federal program. Uh, We have it here in Washington State as well. Um, And so I'm, I'm meeting with Safe Routes to Schools managers, uh, directors that provide Safe Routes programming in those communities that we're partnering with uh, to basically see how we can collaborate and work together and see where there are gaps where we either this, the statewide program or Safe Routes can help close. Um, and so that's that's an ongoing program uh, element that um, I, I'm working to navigate and am relying on, you know, my my colleagues uh, in these different fields and, and different parts of our ecosystem so we can make sure that we're, we're covering all gaps to um, access to safe cycling. Fantastic. Can I add a thought to that, John? Yeah. Um, we mentioned the Move Ahead uh, Washington transportation package that passed a few years. And so and the Climate Commitment Act. So within the Climate Commitment Act, in addition to our school-based bicycle safety education program and getting funding, uh, uh, Safe Routes to Schools grants are coming through this, uh, through the Climate Commitment Act as well. So hopefully we will create more of these Safe Routes to Schools in partnership, really leveraging those federal dollars, as well as uh, the legislature created another uh, Connecting Communities grant program to close some of these gaps between communities so that as a kid, you know, I could I grew up in New, in New Hampshire, small towns are a little closer together. We could sort of ride on sidewalks or in, on the shoulder of roads back then to the next town. But in rural parts of the state where the distances are greater and you might you have state highways, for instance, between communities, which often serve as the main streets for some communities. The legislature also uh, passed a law, essentially a complete streets law, uh, several years back, which our tr- state traffic engineer, Dong Ho Chang, who, whom uh, I know that you know, is sort of in charge of this effort whereby now, if, if a state route is going to have more than $500,000 worth of improvements done, it has to go through a complete streets uh, scoping and analysis to see the feasibility of adding bike lanes, adding sidewalks, et cetera, crosswalks. So that's great. Um, we will see, hopefully, the, that, that's a relatively new program, but in future years, it will pay dividends in, in terms of really connecting our communities more so that they are, people can really get around from town to town, community to community, on bicycle. Yeah, and, and and again, you you mentioned Don Hong Chang. He was previously with the city of Seattle. Um, I was like, oh no, he's leaving. He's leaving Seattle. But he went to the state, which is good. And and the fact that we are seeing some really encouraging stuff, you know, getting on the ground in many of our bigger cities across North America, including Seattle, in terms of protected and separated infrastructure, truly all ages and abilities infrastructure. That's fantastic. Um, it brings me back to worrying Tina a little bit about some. Of of the, the more rural communities, and, and, and Paul, you just mentioned it there as well, is that I think there's really a, a great opportunity to try to leverage when we know that federal dollars are coming in, that we say, you know, are we able to uh, maybe take some of that money 
And really, it's it's pennies on the dollar compared to what we spend in automobile infrastructure. When we talk about automobile infrastructure, we're talking in the billions of dollars and trillions of dollars when we look at the national uh, scope. But in terms of bike infrastructure, this is cheap, even though building a separated multi-use path that's 12 to 14 feet wide seems expensive when you compare it to automobile infrastructure. It's not. For Tina, I, I wonder if you think a, a separated, completely separated multi-use path that's like connecting uh, the schools uh, and the parks and meaningful destinations within some of these rural communities would would make your all your jobs a little bit easier in terms of being able to to really connect the dots from being able to do skills education to what we really want to see, which is more kids using active transportation to get to school. Is that something that you would see as being something that would be, you know, helpful? Um, I think it would be helpful. And I think that that's really where the school-based bike ed program, the statewide program, really includes two programs or two strategies to reach the youth that we're targeting or trying to serve. And so that's elementary, middle school and high school youth. So so the program that I manage, um, you know, we call it the in-class program. That's the elementary, middle school. Uh, We really see that as a strategy to reach the highest number of students we can. Again, it's implemented in PE classes across um, public schools. And we teach the basics of bicycle safety education, right? And so they're learning those those skills. There are lessons within our curriculum about navigating multi-use trails um, and how to make sure students know what to do when they're passing someone, how to pass safely, how to use hand signals. But I, I think this is where the, the second program, the program that takes place in after school settings uh, and can be located either at a school or at a a community-based organization, a nonprofit. That program called Youth Development, uh, the Youth Development Program, which again is modeled after or inspired by the Major Taylor Project, um, in addition to teaching, uh, continuing uh, bike education, they also do things like uh, bicycle maintenance. Um, But there's also this emphasis on youth development and social emotional learning and leadership uh, and and really building students' confidence and self-efficacy. And that really is is there to really set students up to become champions of their lives as they grow into adulthood, whether that is going to college to become a lawyer or a teacher, or perhaps wanting to work in government to advocate for better cycling infrastructure. Um, That very much could be a possibility. So our our strategy, our our program design really tries to build in how we can kind of bring students through that sort of timeline of third grade all the way up to graduating high school and continuing to build those bike bike skills, pedestrian skills, but also those other skills that we all need as we grow into adulthood. So, yeah. What's really interesting too, and I'm glad you really emphasized, you know, that that concept of uh, building the self-efficacy and the self-confidence that kids have. Uh, we see this when, you know, when I'm over in Europe and spending time in the Netherlands, especially, is, you know, you see kids that are empowered to, to be able to get around their neighborhoods and their communities on their own. They're able to, you know, develop those skills, those navigation skills, those social skills. It's absolutely an imperative, you know, going into that next level. So, Paul, kind of the same framing of the question to you is that, you know, with this opportunity to maybe leverage some of these dollars to be able to um, maybe not focus on the roadway, the the actual roadbed, but getting, you know, leveraging some of these dollars to do completely separated, you know, pathways uh, that are physically removed and separated. Uh, I I have this vision, just like in in the Netherlands, where I can ride from village to village, city to city, and, and go through the countryside along waterways, along uh, rail rights of way, um, along canals, et cetera, and, and be able to, to do that. Is that something that you think that is is welcoming within the Washington community to be able to leverage 
the resources to see that happen. Because when we really talk about an all ages and abilities network, just simply having a, a bike lane or a wide shoulder or even a protected bike lane next to fast moving traffic is not truly all ages and abilities. Do you think that there's a, a, an awareness and, and a level of acceptance that's happening now in the state of Washington along those lines? Absolutely. Um, the awareness is growing. And, and you referred to sort of the return on investment from bike infrastructure is incredible. And so the dollars that it costs to build a protected bike lane is uh, because it's a new expenditure in a lot in Seattle or other communities, it can be somehow seen as costly. But yes, when put in the context of all the benefits that come from it, not just the economic benefits directly, but also the health benefits and the reduced, uh, uh, the improved air quality and the sort of the, the whole holistic, all of the benefits of bicycling, the, the ROI is incredible. And we know that you've, you've, I've had the pleasure of, of riding my bike in, in the Netherlands and in other communities in Europe where the infrastructure is there and people use it, not because the Europeans were born with bikes in their DNA, but because they've had the infrastructure for decades and it's a cultural norm. And so we're trying to build that cultural norm here in Seattle and Washington and, and, and folks like you across the country where bikes are, they're just a, a very good tool for transportation and we need to figure out how to use them more. And much of that is infrastructure. And I will say, we are always advocating for protected uh, bike infrastructure, um, you know, separated by concrete barriers, for instance, so that um, the old paradigm of bike lanes was just a, a line of paint on the road. Um, and that is not confidence inspiring or, or necessarily safe. So, so now we're always advocating for separated, protected bike infrastructure where possible. Right, right. Tina, is there anything that we haven't already discussed that you uh, want to make sure that we cover with the audience? Yeah, I just um, I wanted to share a little bit more. Again, this is a part of my job is sharing uh, the impacts of the program uh, with with stakeholders and members of the community. We've seen even just in our first year uh, an overwhelmingly positive wealth of uh, what this program is doing, both in terms of providing uh, an incredible outlet for students to um, learn a new skill and through that really uh, develop uh, self-confidence, which we want our students to have, right? But also the impact that it's been having on the PE teachers and um, our school partners who are uh, implementing the program. Um, you know, all of us, especially your viewers, are, are intrinsically aware of, of the benefits of cycling around, uh, you know, physical, emotional, mental health. But that's also true for, for young people, especially when they're still growing and, you know, really learning about who they are. And so after the, the program runs in elementary schools, we do a, a survey. Um, the PE teachers do a survey and the students complete a survey. It's been very fun reading those post-program surveys from students. Um, but we've been finding for the PE teachers, it's just been incredible. We had one PE teacher say that they've been teaching PE for 24 years and this program has been the most rewarding and impactful program they've ever taught. That was really incredible to hear. And overall, the teachers are reporting that they've seen this program, uh, Learning to Ride a Bike, increase their students' confidence. They're learning new skills. It's helping teach PE teachers meet uh, learning standards, which they need, we want to support. And that that's really great for us to hear. And for the students, you know, the impact really falls under these general themes of it's a way for them to have fun. They're, we need to, kids to have fun. They're kids, right? Um, and having fun in school is just really great to be able to associate that together. Um, it provides them an outlet to get out some energy. We know kids have lots of energy and we know that bike 
cycling really helps us think more clearly. And so then the kids are going into their classes kind of ready to learn. Their minds are clear and they're ready to to learn more. And what's also been really exciting for me to hear from PE teachers is that this program provides students with a space to help other students, uh, especially kids who already know how to ride a bike. We support PE teachers in encouraging them to encourage those students who have these bike skills to help their peers, right? To give them tips and on how to ride their bike, to help them check their helmet, make sure it's fitted correctly and that they're doing the two, two, two. And that skill is really, really valuable. Um, so I think it's just really extraordinary, uh, these positive impacts the program's been having both on um, our youth and the PE teachers themselves. Yeah, and and it and it kind of occurs to me that it's a good thing that uh, the state of Washington is one of those states that still has PE, the physical education, in many and many locations uh, around the the country. Unfortunately, have been dropped or been have been uh, so minimized, and so yeah, it's it's very very unfortunate. Yeah. Can I add another thing yeah, too? Please do. Um, yeah, for um, the statewide school-based program um, that, um, you know, I, I'm just a member, not just a member, I'm a member of a team. I do this together with my team. Um, and so my team is very passionate about really following the vision of, you know, Move Ahead Washington in terms of centering equity um, in all aspects of uh, the program. And, and what that means is that in terms of potential partners, partners who receive uh, the grant funding and, and the program. Uh, we're prioritizing partners who serve communities where equity, safety, and community plans point to the highest need. And that is set forth by criteria, equity criteria established by the Washington State Department of Transportation. So it includes criteria such as demographics, um, like race and ethnicity, uh, disability status. Um, it also includes socioeconomic status, like percentage of students on free and reduced lunch. And then it also includes environmental health disparities. Um, and that's tied into the HEAL Act uh, as part of this legislation. So we also look at diesel emission pollutions, for example, areas that have higher um, exposure. We want to target those because as Paul was saying, one of the benefits of cycling is that it's a, it's a green sustainable um, transportation option. And then the other way that we prioritize and center equity is at Cascade, we believe that everyone um, should have access to cycling and that includes um, individuals with disabilities. And so one of the things that we do that we're duplicating is uh, we partner with our sister organization, Outdoors for All, which is a, another 501c3 nonprofit. They specialize in um, inclusive and adaptive recreation for individuals with disabilities. And so we're partnering with them to ensure that we're meeting the needs of students um, who may require adaptive cycling equipment and uh, support. And so it's really exciting that our, our partners, as part of the grant, they receive, you know, a fleet of bikes that in addition to the bikes, you know, the two wheel bikes in the fleet, they're also getting adaptive bikes because we want all students to be able to participate in this curriculum. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you you mentioned that. Uh, I also uh, you you brought up a, a good point too. In from an equity standpoint, is there a mechanism in place to try to ensure that uh, every kid has access to a bike uh, during the program? Yeah, and one of those ways. What's that's partially what's unique um, about and also impactful about um, the in class program, the program in elementary and middle school, is that. From an equity standpoint, you know, our delivery model really accounts for that because all students who are enrolled in a public school are receiving this curriculum. Of course, we're in grades three through eight, so K through two don't get our program. However, there is another bike ed program that does uh, serve uh, those younger kiddos. Um, but that's one way that we, uh, that this program uh, accounts for that, which is to me, uh, 
an amazing opportunity to continue to refine our program, our curriculum, and our delivery model because we have access to such a, a, a huge population of students across Washington that myself and my teammates just want to make it the best that we can and incorporate feedback from our partners um, and consult with content experts um, across the bike industry to make sure we're delivering something really exceptional and effective. Right. Uh, just to be clear on that too, now are the kids bringing their own bike to school? They are not. So um, the the grant uh, for the elementary and middle school program, um, in addition to, you know, the professional development training we provide to teachers, in addition to, you know, this this curriculum, the Let's Go curriculum that we, as well as other um, folks from from different backgrounds help create, um, they also receive program equipment, which Uh, one of those equipment pieces is okay. is a trailer and that trailer okay. is full of a fleet of bikes um yeah. it's 30 bikes plus the two adaptive bikes and yeah. so say which the is, partner yeah which is similar to to what i had in hawaii i had a trailer full of bikes and i would roll up to the elementary school and and that's one way that we made sure everybody had a bike that was truly operational. Sometimes a kid would show up in, with their own bike and we'd look at it, inspect it and say, all right, yeah, that's safe enough. You can use that. But okay, that that really uh, answers that. I also wanted to pull up that website too. So again, Outdoors for All, and here's one of the adaptive uh, types of cycles that they, they have here. Uh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that, Tina. Uh, all right, Paul, over to you. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, much respect for my colleague, Tina, who is doing incredible work and the an entire education team. But for context setting, as Tina mentioned, we are just in year one here. This is really the, the pilot year of, of expanding this uh, to schools all across the state. So we're learning more. Tina's team is learning more. And so in future years, uh, more and more youth across Washington will be getting this great bike education. And a big thanks also to the state legislature and the citizens of Washington uh, for funding this incredible programming. Washington State, one of the most bike friendly states in the nation and we really wanna hold on to that. It's a real indicator of, um, of leadership, I believe, in this time where we're all concerned about climate change and trying to figure out ways to reduce our climate impacts, bicycling and bike education is, is one big component of that. And so, yes, I hope you'll revisit with us in a, in a year or two when Tina and her team have expanded this to even more schools statewide. And I'm glad you asked about the equity lens because that is a key component of this program for sure. Starting with the schools and school districts that have the highest need according to various metrics and then growing it out from there. So. Come ride and um, uh, come ride bikes with us sometime, John. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm long over too. So my last trip uh, to the area was uh, in uh, 2017, and I did have a chance to produce a fair number of uh, videos right there in the Seattle area, and also took the ferry over to Victoria and uh, met up with Todd Littman there and uh, did a video um, of the incredible infrastructure that is being built out there in in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, Tina and Paul, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much. This was really fun. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, we look forward to chatting with you again, uh, John. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Tina and Paul. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notification bell. And if you're enjoying this content on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to become an Active Towns ambassador. Just head on over to activetowns.org. Click on the support button. Every little bit helps and is very much appreciated. Well, Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.